Hi, and welcome to our weekly communion, staying connected in a changed and ever-changing world. Let me ask you a question. What are the seven deadly sins, and where do they come from? Well, in an article by Becky Little on the History.com website, uh, dated back in March 29 of 2021, we read, in the fourth century, a Christian monk named Evagrius Punctius wrote down what's known as the eight evil thoughts. Gluttony, lust, greed, anger, sloth, sadness, boasting, and pride. Now, Evagrius uh, wasn't writing for you and me or a general audience. No, as an aesthetic monk in the Eastern Christian Church, he was writing to other monks about uh, these eight thoughts that could interfere with their spiritual practice. Evagrius' student, John Cassian, brought these ideas to the Western Church. So from Constantinople, in, uh, which is Turkey in the East, to Rome, where they were translated from Greek to Latin. Now, jump forward to the 6th century, uh, Gregory the Great, who would become Pope Gregory I, rearranged uh, this list in his commentary on the book of Job. And he removed a sloth and he added envy. Instead of giving pride its own place on the list, he described it as the ruler of the other seven vices, which became known as the seven deadly sins, gluttony, lust, greed, anger, envy, sadness, boasting, and pride. Well, fast forward to the 13th century when uh, theologian Thomas Aquinas again revisited the list in Summa Theologica, Summary of Theology. Now, in his list, he brought back sloth and he eliminated sadness. So it looked like this, gluttony, lust, greed, anger, envy, sloth, and boasting. And like Gregory, Aquinas described pride as the overarching ruler of the seven sins. Perhaps you saw the movie Seven. Now, the official list of the Catholic Church today remains the same, except it includes pride in the place of boasting. It has its own place on that list. Gluttony, lust, greed, anger, envy, sloth, and pride. Now, these are the seven sins that many believe that lead to spiritual death and eternal separation from God. But what does the Bible actually say about sin? And how does sin lead us to death? Well, Jesus says a lot about this in Matthew 15, 10 through 20. And in this text, he begins to talk to a crowd. And he tells them to listen and understand what he's about to share. What goes into someone's mouth, food, does not defile them. What goes into a man comes out, but what comes out from their mouth is what defiles them. And as Jesus continued on, he, he, he uses a plant as an illustration. He says, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the very roots. Well, now, uh, Peter asked for Jesus to explain the whole plant and root thing. And I'm going to read this right from the text from Matthew 15 at verse 16. Uh, 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 Jesus looks at his own disciple, Peter, and he says this, Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And this makes a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, 
false testimony and slander. Jesus had his own seven. These are what make a man, a woman, unclean. So Jesus gives his own list of seven deadly sins, and they come from where? The heart. Like a plant, it is not just enough to pick off the bad fruit. We must treat the root, and that means understanding the heart. Now John Street, in his book, Passions of the Heart, Biblical Counsel for the Stubborn Sexual Sins, says this about this subject. The heart of a man, that inner being of the one created in the image of God, is by nature so complex that it has for centuries both amazed and confounded the greatest of philosophers and theologians. Invisible to the physical eye, the heart remains elusive, obscure, requiring much study and contemplation to understand its thoughts and its intentions. How can anyone really know his own heart? Now this enigma becomes apparent when an exasperated Christian exclaims, I can't believe I could ever have such thoughts. Proverbs 29, the obscure nature of the heart is seen as Solomon asked the rhetorical question. Who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from sin? Well, Scripture says that the human heart is deep, hidden, and clever. The purpose in a man's heart is like a deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out, Proverbs 25. It's also described as a dishonest and calculating untrustworthy Proverbs 6 12 through 14 here the heart is described as purposing the Hebrew word used for purpose can also be translated to plan contrary to the world's view of romance and emotion the Bible says that the human heart purposes and plans yet the heart's chief unsettling characteristic is its capacity for self-deception. It is commonplace for the heart to evaluate or assume that it is better than it really is. It is customary for the heart to believe its own innocence. Now over the next several weeks, I will lead you through a study of the heart and the deadly sin that proceeds from it. And you're going to be able to recognize the fruits or characteristics of deadly sin. You're going to be able to trace it back to the deep waters of your heart, the roots of sin. We will identify worldly affections in contrast to what a pure heart should desire. And I will also show you what you can do to foster a healthy heart producing healthy roots and healthy fruits. Would you pray with me? Lord, we want to give you thanks that you have given us everything we need to know in this book right here. Father, we, I confess that uh, my heart is not trustworthy. If it were not for this Bible as a standard of, of life, to, to mirror myself off of uh, as, a, as a standard to weigh myself against. If I didn't have uh, your holiness as my guide, where would I be? For what man, what woman can declare their own heart pure? Father, we thank you that um, you have given us all the tools that we need to uh, confess and leave sin that we have a way to have new DNA in Jesus, uh, clean and healthy roots that develop great and uh, good fruits. I pray that through this series that you will bring us together as a church, O oh Lord, that we might be able to identify those, those bad fruits in our life.
but not merely plicking them off, but to really get down to the, to the depth of the heart to treat the roots. Thank you that we have uh, time for this, that we have uh, your word, and for others who have who've written much about this subject. Father, we give this series to you and uh, what you will do in our hearts, that we might uh, reflect your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for uh, joining me for our weekly communion. And again, I would like to invite you to join me right here on our Baja campus every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for our worship service. Stay well, friends. Stay connected in a changed and ever-changing world.